So what do you go by? Flacco. What's your nationality? Man, I'm a mixture, man. I'm of Latin descent, Italian, uh, native, and uh, European bloodlines as well. So I'm, I'm just a mixture, brother. Grew up, grew up, grew up in an Asa community, uh, Mexican culture around that that type of lifestyle. So I gravitated towards the, you know, where I grew up. I grew up up north, um, out there towards San Jose in a small town called Mopitas, but aligned pretty much with the, the whole county. And out there was a North Daniel Street Gang member. I know you are right now, but what were you incarcerated for? My first case was for shooting into an uh, inhabited dwelling. We did a, we did a drive-by shooting, so it was 246, which is shooting into a house with a 12034, which is discharging a firearm from a vehicle. This occurred back in 1996. And how long was your sentence? My first sentence was five years. When you first got sentenced, how you feel about it? And when you first went to prison, hitting the main line, what was your mentality? Man, when I first got my sentence, I wasn't tripping, man. Um, you know, I hit the streets running at, at 18. I, I, went, I was one of those kids that was in juvenile hall to the ranch. And, you know, before I went to juvenile hall on the ranch, you know, I was out there, and, you know, was just a scrawny kid trying to fit in, trying to have some type of acceptance, some type of respect, you know. And I didn't hit the type of level of game member as I did until I got older. And in juvenile hall, the ranch, I started putting in work and uh, a lot of work because I was from a smaller town. Everybody was from San Jose. So I had to represent where I was from, you know, to the fullest. And by the time I got out of the county jail, man, I hit the streets running, man. I, I was one of those dudes with a banger on my lap, man, a 40 ounce, and was ready to go at any time. You know what I mean? I was a shooter out on the streets. Um, that's the way I lived. And um, I didn't have any fear of going to prison. I, I thought it was my destiny at one time. And uh, I actually almost caught another attempt to murder while I was in the county jail for a slicing. I mean, I sliced and do from ear to ear. And they had tried to charge me with a uh, attempt to murder. Um, I ended up beating, beating the, that charge. They had no case to file because the person who allegedly was telling on me didn't want to be on paperwork. Um, so when I first got my sense, it just to me was just, it was part of the lifestyle. Yeah, you're a little bit of nervous, a little bit of fear. If I was only, you know, I was at a young age. I caught my case when I was 18 years old. You know, so you don't know what to expect. You don't know if people are getting raped in there or punked. And, you know, you're hearing the stories that the North Daniels are outnumbered, um, you know, everywhere you go. And, you know, you have to put in a lot of work and stuff like that. So I just thought it was part of the lifestyle I was going to be living. And, um, you know, I went through reception center, uh, San Quentin, uh, was there for, for quite a while, man. Uh, I think within uh, the first two months, you know, I was already involved in a melee against the Native Americans, we got, we ended up getting off, so I, I ended up in the hole. And I was already striving with, within my collective. And what I mean by striving was is, I was already involved in the prison politics. So for me, this was me uh, reaching that, that that place where I wanted to be, you know what I mean? Because right there in San Quentin, it was, it was our backyard, it was a reception center, so there'd be a lot of northern structure, which you'd call North Sadasa members, which was, at that time, I, that's what I was affiliated with, a lot of NF members, North Sadasa familiar members, so this was the top echelon uh, of where I wanted to be, the people I wanted to be around. And so I was fortunate to, to get a lot of education, meet a lot of uh, what you would call Garnales, which is NF members, a lot of bros, bees, which would be North Sadasa structure members. And, uh, I was striving on that same page, so a lot of them took a liking to me and started going through my indoctrination and started learning the, the different bylaws and within that particular movement. And so by the time I ended up getting to a main line, I was fortunate. You know, I ended up going to a back yard for a Solano State Prison in the 90s. And this was a place where it was, it was a stronghold for us. You know what I'm saying? Like, we ran that prison. It was our facility. So I was fortunate. When I got there, I wasn't too, you know, it wasn't too scary. It was it was like I felt blessed. There was a lot of homies, a lot of people I knew, and I got to meet a lot of homeboys. And it was different, man, as opposed to being in places you hear where, like, you're only, like, 15, 20 North Daniels. I mean, there was, like, close to 100 of us, and there was not, maybe, like, 40, 50 Sureños at that time in the line. And we pretty much ran that facility. You know what I'm saying? It, it, we did what we wanted. You know, it was our backyard. So... That was my first experience on the main line. There, there was no worry, no fear, nothing like that, you know. When I got to prison, you know, you have a little bit of butterflies, man, but, you know, it was interesting. My first day in prison, you know, you know, while we're waiting, it was different back then. You had clerks and stuff that were inmates. And so I was told who to get at when I, when I got there. I was told to get at an individual named Frank 
he works in R and R. He's a homeboy. He'll take care of you. So I told him who, who who sent me when I got there. So I was able to get placed in the right type of housing. And in addition to that, I got to see my first fight in prison. Some Jake Cat black guy just took off with another random black guy while we were waiting outside in the little square where they had us waiting with all our fish kits. And um, you know, that wasn't the only surprise I had my first time in prison. This was a little bit different back then. This is when you had judo rules. But what I mean by that, you had homosexuals back then that were still on the yards. So my first time in, in West Block, man, you know, which is, is, is where they send you in reception center. So I, I find out there's two homeboys I know, a homeboy named Weddle and a homeboy named Chente, both from Sao, and they've known me for years, and, and they knew about, they knew I was a good, solid youngster. So they, they you know, got me uh, equipped with, with what the program was, what to expect, and so forth. And my first day in showers, man, I hit that corner, man. As soon as I hit that corner, man, there's one of those chidobos, <laughs> one of those he sees us in the shower, and it scared the hell out of me, because here you see a, a grown man that looks butt naked like a, like a woman, man. It was it was the scariest sight as a youngster, man. I'm like, oh, I'm not even going in that shower, man. Um, that was my first experience, man, as far as the two places I went, man. There was a lot of different activities that i seen. I started getting involved in the politics at a young, young age, you know, networking, establishing things, learning things about security, holding chain of command positions, I mean, it was a little bit different time there for us as opposed to now. Now it's even a lot more political. But back then, it was kind of optional. You know, and I was one of those ones that decided to get involved in politics at a young age. What made you join the organization? When I got involved with any of these organizations, man, like, you're, you're indoctrinated at a young age. You know what I mean? You learn about the Nuremberg Sadasa movement, about the NF and all that. And you learn about that. This we're just set there to fight oppression. You know, kind of similar to how the others function. You know what I mean? But you know, I'm pretty sure you're, you're kind of familiarized with that. Like the Asians kind of function almost parallel in a way to how Northerners do it in some senses. Um, they're close. To, to, there's a lot of unity, and we're fighting for our existence. And when I learn about the things, the threat from oppositions like the Yemen and the Sureños, this is what's ingrained in us. You know what I mean? And that we're to be the foot soldiers to push the movement to defend the people protect them and that we have all type of bylaw structure you know what I'm saying which means there are certain laws in which we apply on a daily basis to secure educate and establish for our gente we're, the, we're, we're looked at as the forefront as the leaders and I wanted to be a leader you know since since the same way I was on the streets I wanted to go full force with the same attitude that I took when I went to prison I wanted to be involved as much as I can and go to the highest level and you know I was able to do that I was able to get involved I was able to hold key positions, you know, uh, run, run a whole uh, prison later on in my career, you know what I mean? Run the county jail, be involved in the street activities. This is something that I want to emulate in myself. And, and seeing all these individuals that we could look at as big homies, I want to be looked at as a big homie as well. You know, it was basically an ego thing. You know, a lot of people who get in line with these gangs or decide to get involved in the prison politics, it's about power and about having that ego. It's about having that recognition. It's about having people look at you differently than just a regular dude that's just a regular convict that's doing his time. I didn't want to just be a regular convict. I want to be looked at as an elite individual, as one whose name carries weight, one that had, that had a prestige about him that people looked for guidance, looked at as honorable, looked at as righteous. So those were my incentives as far as me striving on a daily basis to be someone better than what I thought I could be. And it all starts at a young age. It's basically you start to get indoctrinated and you start to be given these the sense of direction by your elders, by your homeboys. And it's kind of like a brainwashing uh, brainwashing t t uh, technique in a sense. Because the same thing as I was learning, I started teaching younger, younger homeboys down the road. You know, it, it's, a, it's a, how do you say it, uh, it's a cycle of events of how things are applied, if that makes sense. And what exactly was your position within the organization? Man, I held all kinds of positions, man. You know what I'm saying? I was involved. I was, you know what I mean, anywhere from a foot soldier, you know what I mean, um, out in the streets to home authority in charge position. You know what I'm saying? Um, was involved in a lot of things in the streets as well, man, and what you would call street regiments. You know, I I had my own, uh, own crews established out there on the streets, my, my own military uh guidelines that were expectations, you know what I mean? But also, you know, we'd also understand that there were certain times where I just fell in line, 
where I was just a foot soldier. Or, you know, I'd be put in position as a maestro, as an NT, or I'd be put as the RSD or AIC authority in charge. So I've had held all kinds of different positions. When you get to a certain facility, you fall in your rank and file, and you just go from there. What's the organization's rules and regulations? Well, it depends who you, what you're referring to. You know what I'm saying? Within the, within the, okay, you have different, different, different categories, right? You have the Nuestra Raza, or the structure, or what you call the Insoldados. They follow under the bonds, the formats. They have seven phases to an ordinal schooling, right? And, you know, they have those that are obligated, those that are not obligated. Then you have the NF, which has the Constitution, which has different segments of that. You know what I'm saying? And, um, uh, there's different categories of, 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 you know, ranking when it comes to all the systems. Even the, the, the NR has their own, used to have their own little category system, and they also had their own little chain of command that was up in the bay. You know what I'm saying? So it depends on, you know, where you fall and fall within, within, within these groups, within these movements, within these organizations. Do you run any prison yards? Um, yes, I've ran, okay, I've ran a couple prison yards, okay. I was the, okay, in 2006, I was the authority in charge of DVI Tracy, and I, I ran the whole prison from K-Wing. Um, I established that whole facility to where I had every code um, established out there. All directors were coming through me, so any type of mandate someone had to get removed, it had to be authorized by me. Any clearances or any investigations, I was the final say at that institu institution. So everything was being reported to Kane Wing, and so I was the AIC. You know, I had some events there. I had people removed, a couple people hit. I'm the one that ordered the green light on all Wolfpack skinheads to be removed off our yards and declare war. Um, that's one facility. In San Quentin, I was the RSD there under a regiment commander, so I was second in command, which was a unique situation because of... The regiment commander who was the authority in charge was there on a layover from Pelican Bay. He was an NF member named Frank, and so he was in the infirmary. But they allowed him to go out to the yard and was put in the walk-alone cages right next to the group yard in the hole up there. So me and him would talk every yard, and I would relay everything verbally, everything that was going. A lot of times you'd, you'd want to put things on paper, but he was so sick because he was going through chemo. Right? They had just cut off his leg. He was in a wheelchair. And so there was times where he was so bad that he'd be gone for two, three weeks. And so what he did was is he bestowed me enough authority to make any decisions at that facility. And he would back up any decisions that they came through him because he had that much trust in me. So I ran that. I also ran my county jail, Santa Clara County Jail, which is probably one of the biggest county jails, biggest cities areas up north. And that was around 2000, I want to say 2003, around that time. Uh, there was another person who rolled up that had high rank, and they ended up having to, to be, basically they were the authority of everything, but the communication wasn't there, so I was acting as the ESC until, until I could get in communication with him. And so I was making all decisions, and I was reporting to the streets and doing everything I was supposed to from the county jail as per um, per procedure, per what's, what's the expectations, you know what I mean? And, um... How would you get the message across to different yards and uh, uh, um, in different prisons? Okay, well, inside a set facility, so if you're at that facility, right, depends. Like in San Quentin, I was the one that designed that whole program as well, the communications. And what I would do is I would just have codes for every block. You know what I mean? Like Donner Section would be called, okay, we'd be using maybe sports names. They'd be called the 49ers. Um, Carson section would maybe be the Raiders. East block would be whatever, you know, a football team. And I would send out, these are these are all the directions that are coming from here. And then basically everything would be signed, you know what I mean, from our, from our, from whatever, um, whatever code that we were using. Now in Tracy, I used codes underneath it. So say, say if someone was under investigation, you know, I, I, I would send out a, a code for them to Xerox. And it would be like maybe like 27 different codes that could be important. Like say this person's on freeze. This person needs to be removed. You know I mean, physically to get to the hole. This dude's under investigation. So one, two, three, they would have a Xerox of all these codes. And so when I would send a new to, I would be able to write the wheela and just put this little code letter. Therefore, if the cops end up uh, intercepting the kite, 
they wouldn't know what that code means unless they had the Xerox copy of what these codes were. And so a lot of times in the hall, what you would do is you'd wait till someone goes to ICC, right? And a lot of times I would already have my kites prearranged. They'd already be written out, right? And then I would send those missions out when someone got cleared, they were going to go back to RC. So as soon as we knew someone was going out to a reception center or to the main line, we would send them all the kites and you could go out to the main line. And those relays would get would surface. And usually once a week, someone is leaving out to the reception or main line. So communications would be coming through. And so how we get communications back, like say if we order a removal that someone needed to be removed, everybody would come in with a full roster, all the reports, and all the relays. This is how we maintain communication. And see, in Quinton, though, we actually had certain, we'd be able to go walk by where the reception was, and we'd be able to spit our relays out where the, where the tear tender would be out there cleaning. So we'd be able to identify certain homeboys, and what we would do would be we, we would establish certain codes. Like, say, for instance, you, you use a female nickname, you know, who's your Ruka? You know what I'm saying? And say that, that they're supposed to say they're Ruka Sarah. So if we know he says, oh, Sarah, we know he's an active homeboy, we can shoot that wheeler to the person. Because sometimes you may not know if it's a white boy or if it's a bisa. So we basically relate codes that only us would know. And that's how we, we'd be able to identify. Now, there'd be different ways to, to communicate throughout the streets, you know what I'm saying, or to other prisons. And the type of codes that we would use, right, would be, say, we used to go strike for a while, which means you would empty out a pan to where it's bone dry. And what you would do is you'd write, a, you'd write a letter or even a card or whatnot, and what you would do is in between the, the letter you wrote, you would start to write a message. You would lightly press. And what you would do is you would run a pencil or pen over that, and it would come out what the, what the word is. That'd be one way of communicating. The other way of communicating, which is the best way we have a code, right, is say like me and you are in a prison. We're in the Pelican Bay. You're going to go out to, to say, high desert. You know, I'm validated, but, you know, you're going to go out to the main line. So what we, we would do is we would establish a code that only me and you would know with words. Like, for instance, I'm going to go eat at Jack in the Box. That could be me, mean someone owes money. You know what I'm saying? Or that person's a hood rat. That means they're actually in good standings. You would establish some type of code that only you would know, only you could decipher. And as far as, as, far as any type of uh, encryption centers, like by the FBI or anything, they can't break those codes if only you and that person know. And sometimes you would have direct relays, like say like, you know, you're in like DVI or San Quentin or Delano, those are reception centers for, for the North Daniels. And say what you would do is you would basically write, write have all your reports, your investigational packets, your, uh, your B&Ls, which are bad news list, or any type of clearance relays that you would have, like say this person's been cleared or this and that, and a roster of everybody there. You know, everything is based on information. In order to secure your people, whatever group you are, the more informative you are with things and more uh, strict policies and procedures you have, the more security you can put on your people. So you would prepare all these relays, and we call them bundles, and you would send them out to people who are going to the shoe. These people were getting transferred to the Bay and Corcoran. And at that time, when I was in the system, well, there was a, there was a little, little, you know, dissension about where headquarters was at. But we were forwarding everything to the Bay, Pelican Bay at that time. You know, but if it touched base in Corcoran or Tatsby Shoe, we were okay with that because there was enough C's that were in contact with our NF members that, that can process things to a higher authority. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, um... Can you name things that gets an individual DP or removed from the yard? Can I what? Can you uh, name? We'll get some of them? Yeah, and things that get the individuals removed from the yard. Well, the common things we already know would be some funny style charges or some paperwork, right? I mean, but those are within any group. But say if, if someone has breached certain laws, you know what I'm saying, and they have a track record. Like, for instance, man, like, say, say something kicks off, right? Say, 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 the whole, say some North Daniels get sent down to Avenue, there's like seven or eight of them. You know what I'm saying? And, or t even 10. And say, like, you know, they get off with the bulldogs, the bulldogs rush him. Say, like, a homeboy doesn't do nothing, he hides, and he stays on the yard, and he programs, and he complies with whatever they tell him. Like, they tell him he can't take off his shirt, or he can't do this and that. He, you know what I mean? That'd be a cowardice act, number one. Number two, that would be, he, he failed to defend his household. The homeboys got rushed, and he didn't do nothing. So that would be the, that'd be something that'd be a prime example of someone getting hit. As well as things with, with people's family. You know what I'm saying? There, there's been people who have disrespected homeboys. Women out there on the streets or, uh, you know, tried to get at people that were underage. I mean, anything that, that, 
anything that's common sense that wouldn't be acceptable. There, there, it's all what you, we call due process, which means it has to be fully investigated. But once you come to certain terms, I mean, you got to look at who the individual is. I mean, how bad the, the charge was. Was it a grave violation, which means something serious? And you also got to look at their, you know, educational uh, uh, attainments, you know, to, within the political spectrum of things. You know what I mean? Like, if you have a first-termer, and he's with some other dude, right? For instance, I had some dude removed, hit, right, for when that stuff happened with, with the wolf pack. There was a dude named Cisco from Susanville who was getting jumped by, like, five skinheads, right? It's after, you know how it is. After you hit a particular group, the, the rest of the group's going to hit. And our pilots were only the, the wolf packs. But the skinheads and white boys don't know. So they jumped. They kicked off a little riot. And this one Norman who'd been in the system, he had a K number, which means he'd been in the system since the mid-'90s. And this occurred like in 2006. So he's been around at least 10 years. So he knows better. He's seen the homeboy get jumped. He was like maybe 10 yards away, maybe even closer than that. And he didn't do nothing. He got down and watched his homeboy got jumped. And there was other people that confirmed it. So for, for us, you failed to defend the household, you know what I'm saying? Which is a treasonable offense. Now he was with a first termer, somebody from his hood. And so this youngster seen this dude get it down, down so he was following his lead. So, there's a thing, different strokes for different folks. So because it was a first term, we were going to give him the benefit of the doubt and salvage his career you know I mean? and, and make it to where he can clean, clean it up. But the one that had been in the system for that long, by now you should know what time it is. You should know you have to act. You should know that's a cowardice act. That's desertion. You just deserted a brother in battle. So those are like the prime things that will get someone hit, you know, as well as, making, as, well as endangering any life. Like if you make a decision, say, at a facility and you have someone hit and it was a bad call, then now you're going to get hit. That's just how it goes. That's just, you know, I mean, there's going to be no toss for those who are become renegades and abuse their positions or just have people hit unjustly. So you have to go through a whole through a process of investigating, you know, through facts, corroboration, clarification. You can't go by what you think happened. You have to go by factual situations. Who, what, where, where am I? You know, like any time I'd run an investigation, I would look for five W facts, which are who, what, where, when, why. I don't care what you think happened. I don't care what you think about this individual. I want to know exactly what happened because you have someone's career at stake there. And it should take a lot just to get people hit. Nowadays, you got people getting hit for stupid stuff. You know what I mean, politics and, and the sense of uh, security and everything has, has totally changed, man. But back then, we used to take it really, really serious. So if they survive the removal, where, where would these individuals go from there? Where would it go from there if someone survives a, re a removal? Yeah. Well, that depends on them. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times they're going to lock it up. They're going to go to SMI. You know, but there's been people who've been hit, and sometimes they've been unjustly hit. And what they do is that they, they don't lay it down, and they file the reports, and they get a hold of some type of big homie that can potentially clear them. And there's been some people who, who've got some get backs. You know what I'm saying? Or there's also been people who've messed up and they've been paid a hefty fine. They've been taxed. And they've been able to be brought back. You know what I'm saying? So it just depends on the individual. I'd say the majority of people who get hit, they go they go into SMI. You know, which my time era, we didn't have SMI back then. You know, it, SMI started to come in as I was in the system, but at first they weren't there. So say you got hit, that person would end, sometimes end up at another facility. You know what I'm saying? And maybe he gets hit again. And so eventually he, he touched, because back then you had maybe a couple of facilities that they weren't S and Y yards, but they were no good for, for certain individuals. You know what I mean? Like CMC East had a lot of dropouts on it. You know what I'm saying? But they would send people that were active. I got sent there one time in the early 90s, I mean late 90s, you know, and they would just, they they had no designated yards back then, like for like PCs or SMY. You know, same thing with Mill Creek and Jamestown at that time. You know, Jamestown was a weird yard because the Northerners would be not active on that yard, but the Southerners and white boys would be, and the Africanos. So it, it was a trip back then. I mean, but it all depends upon the individual, man. Were you involved in any riots, and did you personally shot call any green light on any other groups, and what was the reason? Um. I've been involved in a few. Um, I, I got off with the, uh, like I said, the Native Americans, and that, the reason behind that was back then they had a, the homeboy that was sold up with another, 
and was an older homeboy. I think his name was Bobby Lucha. I think he was from San Fran, and that native dude ended up taking off on him. And you know how politics are. You don't take off on another group. You know what I mean? That's a no-no. And back, see, back then, sometimes you'd have northerners that would sort of put others back then, or with natives or whatnot. I mean, that'd be, that'd be common. Because a lot of homeboys would say they were others because if things went on lockdown, they could sneak out there to the yards. So this incident happened. And they were approached politically. You know, you know how politics are. You have to be diplomatic. You can't touch another group. If you do, it's going to kick off a riot. So they told him that they had to. We told them, this happened to San Quentin, that you have to deal with this individual. You know, individual that was running the yard was a cat named Spokio from Salinas, and this was in uh, Alpine section. Yeah, it was Alpine. This was in the 90s, and um, they refused to deal with the person. So what we ended up doing was we sent some some one guy back then who was going to discharge his number in four days to take off on that dude physically. Bam, smash him. It was a cat named Samoan Paul. And then after that, we decided to rush all of them. Because you didn't deal with it, we're going to rush. Not only are we going to take off on him, now we're going to rush all of you guys. So that, that's how it kicked off. That was one of my first rides. Another one, we got to another melee with some with some skinheads. And that was a whole long situation, man. It happened in Solano, man. That, that happened to do with some politics and... They targeted me and the whole way out because they felt disrespectful and offended because we told them what, what side of the yard you got, that you got, they couldn't be posted on our side of the yard. And a lot of, we heard that they didn't even want to be on the yard. We heard different rumors and they watched our program. They planned it out. They came in with tobacco. They were ready, they were ready to take off on us. And so we were walking on their side of the yard. They ended up rushing us. Now I had, I had to make that call on the wolf packs and 2006, you know, a lot of them got stabbed. You know what I mean? Because those were the orders I gave because at that time, I guess they'd been green-lighted by the AB at this time, but back then they were like, them, the P9, the NLR, they were doing a lot of bidding for the AB. They were like junior ABs. And we weren't letting, you know, it was in our policies that we would not, or laws, that we wouldn't let no AB, no NLR walk our yards. And we were starting to understand that these dudes were now doing their bidding on these main lines. And so there had been a riot that happened in Solano between the, the, the skinheads and the North Tales. I think even the North Daniels got thrown off a chair or something like that, if I remember right. And the North Daniels had got, got their get back, so it was like a big scene going on. But, you know, issues that happen in one prison aren't supposed to go on to other prisons. You know what I mean? It's supposed to stay at that facility. But apparently there were some skinheads that were upset about it. And they had ended up sending the kite to a certain individual that they th they were quickly going to uh, take off. And they sent the kite to the wrong person, man. They ended up sending it to a, to a North Daniel. And they were planning to attack the North Daniels out there in the reception center. You know what I mean? Based on the activities that were happening in Solano. We've seen that. And so, whether they didn't wait to see if this was affirmed or confirmed, you know what I'm saying? Because of these guys were, were basically junior, basically what we were calling junior ABs, junior Aaron brotherhoods, even though they're not technically, but they were doing their bidding, I elected not to let them walk our guard. So I ordered for all of them to be removed by bloodshed. And what I mean by that, all with a piece. Not no, not no tomahawk, not no razor blade. I said they have to be removed with a piece. All of them have to be removed off our yard. And so that elected to kick off a war. And it had nothing to do with the whites, but the whites didn't understand that. All they seen was their people getting stabbed. So it became a white North Daniel thing. And, um, you know, the cops were kind of dirty back then. You know what I'm saying? They, they had set up some North Daniels afterwards. They, they ended up releasing some, uh, uh, some, some woods that were walking. Why an uh, older North Daniel that was in a wheelchair was going to medical. He ended up getting stabbed. Uh, they ended up putting four white-looking North Daniels in a cafeteria with, like, 50, 50 woods. And those homeboys got the business, of course. You know, I mean, they got they got rushed. They got they came in pretty beat up. So, the, you know, the trick, the DVI correctional staff, they were kind of a little faulty because they favoritized the white boys because a lot of them were from Butte County and all that area. And so they had something against the North Daniels at that so they were mad that we kicked off that riot. So they were basically helping them out a little bit. But it went it went back back and forth pretty much tick for tack. Of course, you know what I mean, we, that was that was more of a stronghold for us in numbers. You know what I mean? We had we had the we had the foot soldiers and all that, but we were suffering a lot of what do you call um, dirty tactics by the police at that time, man. And um, we basically tried to have a stand down the road towards any woods because it had nothing to do with any whites. You know what I'm saying? They just needed to jump because they seen their people getting rushed. So that was another one that I called. You know, I mean, those were the two main, th the three main issues that, that I gone through in my career. Besides being involved in a lot of stabbings and stuff like that, and a lot of slicings, which I don't choose to talk about on a personal level. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
Yeah, I was, I was involved in a lot of different hits, a lot of different removals. I called a lot of hits. I called a lot of removals. Um, but that was just the life of expectations of holding a position. You know, you, you, you get put in these authority positions. You're going to have to make certain decisions, certain choices. And me calling that on the Wolfpacks was it was for our people's safety. You know, these guys are probably preparing. You know, and, you know, the person who got that kite, man, was a trustworthy individual. So, of course, we were going to honor that. You know, it came through the right pipeline. They basically slipped. Their security w was in a par. And what happened was when the, when you heard the bells and you heard all the ringing, there, there was this one uh, skinhead cat, man. He was annoying on the chair, man. Don't get me wrong. There was some cool, cool woods that were there on the chair that were real respectful, that were validated, man. But there was this one cat, man, who he just pulled from Solano. And he starts talking over the tears, saying, yeah, I told you they were coming. I told you they were coming to his other white partners, right? Little did this dude know, man, it was us that rushed them. So I was sitting in my cell laughing, man, because I knew, I knew already it was us because we already had planned this out, man. We were two steps ahead of them and what they were preparing, preparing to do to the North Daniels on that facility. You know, and we hit them first. Did you ever do a shoe term? Yeah, I got validated by 1999. I got validated as a uh, Northern Instruction member. I went to Corcoran Shoe. I've been there like three times. Um, you know, it, it was it was a good experience. I mean, it was a trip. You know, there was other people. There was like a lot of Mexican Mafia members there, a lot of Sudanians that were camaradas, a lot of ABs, it, you know, a lot of BGF cats. And it was all respectful, man. Like, I've seen some crazy things in there. I've seen doors pop open and, you know, People get stabbed, people get sliced up in their cell, you know what I mean? People try to hang their cellies and stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, I see, I also seen people that lose their mind in the shoe, you know what I mean? Uh, get into it with the cops, you know what I mean? I've, I've, I've also seen dudes try to rape their cellies and stuff in there, man. Well, you don't see it, but you hear what happened, you know? The, pulling the guy out bloody, man, he, his cellie was trying to rape him, you know? I actually ran into uh, Charles Manson when I was in the shoe. He got busted when he was in the, he was in the protective housing unit. He got busted for doing something. They put him in the shoe, man. So I actually seen that cat in the shoe. That was, he was interesting. He was telling everybody, uh, when there'd be a new arrival that came in, right? He, he would, he would yell out of his chair, cell nine, cell nine. You know what I mean? I'm the shot call for the blacks. I'm gonna get at you on a kite, man. He was just a crazy looney dude, man. He's only like about five foot one, five foot two. So it was kind of comical, man. Um, yeah, but it was it was off the hook in the shoe. It was a lot a lot different, man. I was there when they went from the group yard to, to the walk alone cages, man. And uh, you know, and there it's it's a whole diff, different game. When I first went there, man, you know, you're gonna have a piece at ready at all times. Everybody got a piece, everybody got weapons. You know, but there's a lot of respect, man. That's where I started to learn about having respectful relationships with all kinds of different individuals and how serious it could be because all it takes is one sign of some type of disrespect and it's war. You know, people are going to start trying to spear you, spear you through, the, uh, through their doors or they're going to try to, you know what I mean, figure out a way to get you. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, the shoe was fun. She was, she was, it was not fun. It was, how do you say it? It was an experience that we made the best of it. You know, it's a very treacherous environment. A lot of things going on, a lot of politics going on. And for me, it seemed like every group was more concerned with focusing on their own things that they had going in with their collective. How did they validate you? Man, they found all kinds of, they found one of my, a PFN number to someone in the county jail. They used some writings I had both that were concept of leadership that came out of a book. Um, and they also had some 1030s on me. Uh, people basically, you know, drop and saying that you're this and that. So then what they do is they, they present a little packet and they send it to Sacramento. And Sacramento either affirms you're validated or not. You know what I'm saying? This was way back, like in, this was like in 98, 99 when they validated me. Now you brought up like um, an individual raped his celly um, in the shoe, right? So. When I was incarcerated, um, you weren't allowed to rape another individual because they consider consider that homosexuality. Now, can you elaborate on how is that permissible? When you well, this, was a, this was this was the nineties, man, and it, this was a. I mean, there was that stuff was going on. Like you got him in Cork and shoot, you had dudes that had been for fifteen, twenty years for those type of activities, man. You know, there's a lot of stuff that was going on in the eighties and seventies, man. I mean. They were engaging in that. They, they were. They, some of these dudes had their own punks. You know what I'm saying? So this dude, you know what I mean? Was pretty much. He probably was just a regular civilian, man. 
or was not a, or didn't care about his affiliation, man. So he he tried to take the piss up on the youngster that came up in his cell, he tried to take his try to take his manhood. You know what I'm saying? But uh, maybe he did because the dude came out all bloody. They had to drag him out. It was pretty bad. You know, but um, you know when I first was going to the system, there was actually um, there was actually what you call ch chidugos, those hishis on the yard. You know what I mean, we weren't allowed to engage in them. You know, as far as engage with them like that. You know what I mean. But there were certain groups that would, honestly, they would still engage with them. You know, it wasn't it wasn't as taboo as it as it became later in the two thousands. You know, within the within the North Angeles it was. But there was other groups that were actually trying to get on them punks. They were trying to talk to them. They were trying to hustle them. They were trying to get whatever they could, whether that be some type of favors or, you know, have them take care of them. It was a little bit different, kind of a trip. You know what I'm saying? Um, eventually, they, they put all those those people on SMI yards, but. You know, the laws change, and I mean, like, stuff used to happen back in the 80s and 70s and even 90s like that, man. And people are going to keep keeping on quiet, but it is what it is. So these individuals that rape other individuals, um, they weren't considered homosexuals? No, uh -uh, they were, man, we wouldn't let them walk on our lot. Yeah, pretty much I would consider them that, man. You know what I'm saying? There was no huge influence, but you would hear about them in Corcoran Shoe. I mean, there was the one that was the... the bandit they had over there, man. You know, but uh, it was one of those things that, man, just people just didn't talk about it. They just turned their, they turned a blind eye. There wasn't as much politics as when you hit the system, man. You know, so, like I said, you would see certain groups that would engage in that. You know what I'm saying? You know, it, it was a total trip. I mean, we did it. You know what I'm saying? As far as our collective, the people I ran in, but I've seen other groups that would engage in it, man. You know what I'm saying? I've heard all kinds of stories, so you know, besides, environment. besides, um, you know, I guess sexual things, uh, pleasures. I mean, what what would benefit from, um, you know, what I mean, like, you know, taking another individual's manhood. What what would benefit them? I mean, yeah, is this person gonna be like their wife or, or fold their clothes and do their laundry or something? I have no idea, man. You'd see that though back then, though, man. Believe it or not, man. I have no idea, man. Kind of tripped. I was a youngster. Well, I, like I said, I was involved in the politics. That would be a no-no. You know what I'm saying? But you seen it back then. You know what I mean, like it was a little trippy and trippier back then. It happened, man. Um, not as much as as it sounds. You know what I'm saying? Like the, like the taking the people, like the taking, you know what I mean? People taking their manhood, that's a rare thing to happen. That dude was just a sick individual that was a beast that was going to do it. You know what I mean? There's always going to be one or two, you know, some, some holdovers from the 70s and 80s where they think it's okay. But that wasn't like an ongoing thing like you think. You know what I mean, there was enough enough of those that were willing that you didn't have to take someone's manhood. You just had to figure out a way to get there. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, I would never engage in it, man. I don't see no benefit to it, man. Let's, I mean, I look at it as people who could do that, man. They must have a sick mind. But to each his own. You learn not to judge what another person does. If that's what they're doing, that's what they're doing. You know? And um, as far as choosing individuals to go on a mission or, or conduct any type of removal uh, or DP, uh, how, how would those individuals be chosen? Or would this be volunteer? <laughs> Well, you know, there's always going to be those that you know are striving. So you're always going to have those torpedoes or those that are willing to put in that work. So they'll, they'll be the first. They usually, if, unless they've been in trouble, say if someone got disciplined and they did something wrong and instead of doing them no good, they've been put on frontline status or what you would call cleanup, which means the first removal that has to happen, they have to do. Now, if you're already a, a, a survival that's committed, you can also have your number called. But a lot of times you're going to try to utilize those that you know that are striving, some youngsters that are ready to put in work that don't care. Those are going to be the ones that you would prefer because you know they're going to put their all because they want the attention to do it. That's how you, that's how you figure out someone who's going to do the removal. Or say someone's in trouble and they're under investigation and they need, they need to get to the hole. You're going to pick that individual too because if they refuse to do it, then you're going to have, you're going to have them hit right after. So it's all a process, you know what I mean? It's... it's, it's all about, you know, you, you want to make sure that whoever you stand is capable of doing it as well. But there's always going to be those that are willing or those that are obligated to do it. So you have your different options. It's about doing what's the best option for your household. Okay, as far as um, being um, involved in the organization and being a high-ranking member uh, of that organization, did you have the that organization in prison 
have any control out in the streets as far as um, taxing any uh, other gang members or, or, or North Daniels all, on the street? All these, all these organizations do. All these movements, all the stuff taxes do. They, they all, that's the taxation. They don't call it taxation, no. That's, that's the term that the Mexican mafia uses. The, like as far as if you're if you're an NF member or NF associate, whatever you may be, and you're working for the regiment, which means you're aligned to the NF under their bandana, which means you represent them, uh, you're going to call it contributions. You know what I'm saying? It's the, same, it's the same thing as far as in all these organizations. They want to take control of their communities and tax anybody that's making money in their neighborhoods. And it's the same thing. So all, all these organizations have one purpose, and that's to generate income, to generate money, you know? It's, it's, you know, and, you know, say if you're out there, if someone's out there selling dope and they're making money and they have that red in hat, you know what I'm saying? And eventually they're going to come to the county jail. So you're going to sit there and put the, that scare to them. Like, look, either you're going to work with us, you know what I'm saying? Or there's going to be consequences. You know what I'm saying? Those consequences could happen when you get locked up or those consequences could be when we send some soldiers to your house and they kick in your door. You know, you're not going to see what comes. You know who we, who we are and what we represent. Now, either you're going to work with the people or you're going to be an enemy to people, and it's just it's sold just like that, and that's how you get different people to contribute contribute in what you would call tax taxation. I call contribution a nice word of saying you're taxing them because the word tax is, is a word that we used to tell people all oh, the inmate taxes their own people. We don't do that, so it's a way to try to positively enforce people's involvement, wanting to work with these groups. Um. Can you touch upon uh, the subject of who, who uh, who's uh, the organization's rivals? Okay, for, okay, let's look at the, the name for it, right? So traditionally you have the Mexican Mafia, the MA, you know, they've been called the Mexicano Garcilaro, and they've actually been at war with the BGF and the newest of Familia. Same thing with the AB, AB's been at war with the NF and the, BG, and the BGF, and, and all these organizations have been going. There was a loose alliance, that the NF had with the BGF in the 70s. And it was just a working relationship. Your enemy is the same enemy as mine. There was a strong alliance between the AB and the MA. You know what I'm saying? Aryan Brotherhood. They've always had a, 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 an alliance. But nowadays, how the system is working now, all these groups work independently. There's no longer strong alliances. You may program on the same yard, like with how it's previously been, like, you know, whites are kicking in with Southerners and... and you know, blacks with northerners, but I, I heard even that's changed, man. I heard there's a lot more interactions with North Daniels and Sorenos behind the wall. There's a lot more, you know, there's no more, like, for this end hostility thing that you got going on, that there's a lot more respect and, and common goals that everybody's independent now in a, in a fashion that no one's really at war. Everybody's dealing with their own, you know? That's that's where all these removals and hits happen. There's no longer, like, any any hundred-man riots like there used to be. It's, it's all po political within their own. And um, why why are uh, there there's issues with these uh, other groups? I mean, is it uh, um, you know, is it control over the prison system with terror uh, control like some type of, you know well, then, uh, well, territory or something? Well, the way it was, man, it was it was, it was just a thing just to control these the bidding of these yards. You know, the, you know each each group had influence over different sets. You know, the beats had pretty much died out. A lot of Crips and Bloods formed in the Haven, the Bay Area, the Kumi cars, but they're all like separate. Some some are involved in politics, some are not. You know what I mean? Then you have the North Daniels that fall under, under the NF, and then you have the Short Daniels fall under the MA. Because most of the big homies were, were locked down, so the force continued out there on these main lines. Going into a, certain, certain prison yards for, if you were from up north, you were going to be outnumbered, so you had to sit there and have backbone. You had to be ready to ride. You know what I'm saying? You had to be ready to stop any type of threat from a, anybody that was trying to oppose you or oppress you. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of people who try to dictate your program, and that's where conflicts happen. Because if you're a group that has less in numbers, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if you've experienced that, because I, 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 I'm going to assume that you ran with the other car, right? Am I correct or wrong? Yeah, you're, you're right. So, so you get it You get it being less in numbers, you know what I mean? So you as a group still want to have your showers, right? You want to still have your tables. You still want to have the same privileges and incentives as, as every group. And when you have other groups that are, are bigger in numbers, they're trying to press you and take you away from having your rights. And that's how it was for a lot of us, being from north on a lot of yards. There was only a slick few prisons where we ran, like, completely. So we'd be, common, be sent to yards for where the, maybe there's only 15 of us on a yard. 
y entonces 100, 150 sureños. Y we're still going to fight for our existence on that yard. We're still going to fight to have handball courts. We're still going to fight to have telephones. We're still going to fight to have TVs. And if you tell us that we can't have those things, we're getting off. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but those are the things that we used to strive for. It wasn't about just because I'm from the north and you're from the south, or you're, you're a woman, I'm a northerner, or, or anything like that. There's usually some type of oppression that's being formed that's going to incite something, some type of disrespect. And when people get, get powerful numbers and they think that you can, they can dictate your program, is where you're going to give, get an uprise. Any movement, any cause, anything that you do behind the walls, right, or even in life, has to be formed, any movement has to be formed off oppression. Without the threat of any type of enemy or oppression, you don't give rise to these little subgroups that are going to take a stand. So it's just, it's just common, common knowledge. Just, but during my time there and before me, it was a, it was a big deal back in, back in those days, man. There was a lot of bloodshed, man, a lot of stabbings, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of fighting just to have your existence on the yard. It wasn't easy. And what's the benefit of being, um, you know, uh, a prison gang leader? What's the benefit behind that? Well, most of the prison gang leaders, man, of course, they're going to benefit financially. You know what I mean? They're going to be looked at as gods. They're going to be powerful. They're going to have influence. You know, a lot of these men that, that, that ascend to these positions, they have big egos. And so that's all they got. You know what I mean? They're, this is their life. This is their society behind prison walls. You know, being in prison is like its own little world. You know, it's not like society. So some of these people don't have anything that they can grasp to in society, so their life is going to have to be behind prison. And like any man, right, we want to always strive to, we're all egotistic. We all strive for, the, strive for the same things. We want that power. We want money. We want influence. We want control. And especially if you're from that gang culture, it's the same life that you have out in the streets. You want all those same things. So a gang leader is going to be able to have all those things on a whole higher level. What does it take to be a gang leader? Um, I mean, what what I mean, what do they have to do? I mean, to, to be a gang leader and even to be accepted in that in that prison or organization or gang. Well, first of all, like you have to be looked at as worthy. You have to be looked at as beneficial and lucrative, because in order to be part of any of these groups, right, you got to have some type of purpose. You got to either be ready to ready to take someone's life, or you got to be able to bring them like tens of thousands of dollars. You know, what it comes down to within these prison gangs, organizations, it's about money now. It always was. All this other stuff is used as leverage, as a control mechanism, as, as an influence. So if you can attain that you show that you have, that you're analytical, that you have leadership skills, that you're sharp, but at the same time you're ready to kill, and that you're ready to put this, whatever, whatever, whatever organization it may be, that you're ready to put that organization before anything else, you're going to be a prime candidate to be accepted into one of these organizations or at least to be looked at to be recruited. You know what I mean? Each organization has a different process. I mean, I'm not going to go into all that as far as how these organizations recruit because they're, they're all going to be different. But those are the qualities you want to look at in a person. And it's all about where you end up or in who you're around. If you're around the right person, a lot of times the person's going to be given that opportunity. But there's been people who've been trying to make these, these uh, uh, this their dream and their goal for 30 years in the system. They still can't get to it. The blood, blood out mantras that you see and all that, those are real, man. You have to be ready to take some out, man. You, when you, if you're caught upon any of these groups, that's going to be a reality. I heard you uh, have a YouTube channel. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's me and my boy, Rojo, man. It's called The Convict's Perspective. And we talk on everything from, we talk about all the prison gang organizations. We talk about everything from the NF to the MA to uh, even issues that are going on politically in the world. Uh, we're trying to help kids out there and convey a positive message. We're trying to help out ex-convicts as well. You know, we're trying to support a positive message and be impactful, man. And we have we have interviews of different people. We've had some people upstate surveillance on there. We've had uh, different authors on there. We've, we've even told our own personal stories. So our channel is very diverse. It's very, um, you know, it's different. You know, you never know what we're going to bring on there, man. So it's a conflict perspective. It's with me, your, your boy Flacco, and with Rojo. So if you guys haven't checked it out, man, check it out. There you have it. Um, we'll check out uh, um, the gentleman's channel, um, Econics Perspective. Don't forget to like, uh, leave comment, and subscribe to his channel.